Hi, I'm Maurice Dupre, and in this section, we're going to discuss integration by parts. In effect, just about every rule for differentiation gives some kind of useful rule for integration or anti-differentiation. Let's now look at the product rule. Product rule for differentiation can be simply written with the prime notation for differentiation as f of x times g of x quantity prime, that is the derivative of the product f of x times g of x, is the derivative of the first factor times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, that is f prime of x g of x plus f of x g prime of x. So consequently, I can write that as an anti-differentiation formula. The antiderivative of the derivative, of course, is just itself f of x times g of x. But of course, with our integral notation, we're now going to add the arbitrary constant capital C. And so consequently, the product plus any constant is the antiderivative of the right-hand side, which is the integral of f prime of x g of x dx plus the integral of f of x times g prime of x dx. Notice that this can easily be rearranged to give an anti-differentiation or indefinite integral formula. If I take this term and put it over to the left, moving, exchanging this one, what we get is the formula integral f of x g prime of x dx equals the product f of x times g of x minus the integral, the indefinite integral of f prime of x times g of x dx. You may remember when you substitute, say, u equals g of x in, a, in an integral, then du is g prime of x dx. So I can think of this as like a du. Well, here's the product, f of x times g of x. And over here, I have a very similar type expression, which looks like g of x times f prime of x dx. That's another differential, that is g of x times the differential of something. And so what I want to do is look at that more carefully. This time I'm going to think of the f of x as being u and the g prime of x dx, I'm going to think, that, think of that as the differential dv. Over here in this integral, think of this one as g of x times f prime of x dx. Now, if u is f of x, then this one becomes du. f prime of x dx is du. And if v is g of x, then dv is g prime of x dx. And so consequently, what I have here is simply integral u dv equals, notice there's u, there's v, we have uv minus integral v du. And so that's a summary of what we call integration by parts. Notice it came directly from the product rule for differentiation. It's the integration by parts formula, which you should easily remember. u dv integral u dv equals uv minus integral v du. And so when we apply this, what we're doing is looking in case we see a product where one of the factors we can anti-differentiate. Notice to go backwards to find v from dv, we have to anti-differentiate. So if I can anti-differentiate one of the factors in the integrand, then I get to differentiate the other factor. Well, differentiation is usually straightforward and easy. And so here we've transformed the integration problem into a new problem, which hopefully is simpler. Well, let's look at an example where we can use integration by parts. Here I have the indefinite integral 
of the quantity T square cosine T dt. So remember to apply integration by parts, I'm going to look for a product and ask myself which one is going to lead to the most simplification if I differentiate it and which one's going to be the most difficult to anti-differentiate. It's just as easy to differentiate as anti-differentiate this trig function cosine t, whereas on the other hand, differentiating t squared lowers the power. Anti-differentiating would raise the power. So let's use t squared as u, and then the cosine t dt is our dv. So now du is 2t dt v. Well, an antiderivative of cosine t, that's sine t, since the derivative of sine is cosine. And so now remember our integration by parts formula says the integral u dv is uv minus the integral v du. So we have t squared sine t minus the integral of v, that's the sine of t, du. Well, that's 2t dt. Well, we still don't have something that we can easily spot the antiderivative of, but notice again, in this integral, we have a product, and we can apply the same technique again. If I differentiate the t, and anti-differentiate the sine t, now the power of t will have gone to zero. Okay, so we have t squared sine t, and over here, let's write this integral in the reverse order of factors here. Factoring out the two, we have negative two integral t sine t dt. So now I'm going to apply integration by parts to this integral. We can apply integration by parts repeatedly over and over. So here I will set u to be equal to t. Sine t dt is going to be the dv. And if that's the case, du is now simply dt, whereas v is the antiderivative of sine t. Well, the derivative of cosine t is negative sine, so the antiderivative of sine t is negative cosine t. And so consequently, we have t squared sine t minus 2, and now we're going to apply our integration by parts formula, u times v, well, that's t times negative cosine t, so that'll be negative t cosine t, and then minus integral v du, so that's negative cosine t du, which is simply dt. Notice one of the things here is that we have so many negative signs and when you start integrating by parts and you have to do it a couple of times and you have antiderivatives introducing negative signs, you have to be very careful with the signs. So we have t square sine t and now negative 2 times negative t cosine t, that's plus 2t cosine t. And then negative 2 times negative times negative, well, that's 3 negative, so that's back to negative. So we have negative 2 times the antiderivative of cosine t, which is sine t. And of course, what's the last step? Add the big capital C. Let's look at an example where we have an inverse trig function. Here, I want to compute the indefinite integral of the inverse tangent of y dy. 
Here's an example of one of a family, and that is we have an inverse function in the integrand. When you see that, integration by parts is a very useful way to go in the following simple way. Think of this as being a product where the other factor is simply 1. So we have tan inverse y times 1 dy. And so now I'm going to set u to be the tan inverse of y. dv is simply dy. Notice I will be anti-differentiating 1, which will give me a factor of y. In some sense, it looks at first like I'm making things more complicated by doing this. But remember, when I compute du, I get to differentiate the inverse tangent function, and it's simply a rational function. The derivative of tan inverse y, remember, is 1 over 1 plus y squared. So du is 1 over 1 plus y squared dy. And so consequently, according to the rule of uv minus integral v du, for integration by parts, I have the product of u times v. Well, what is v? If dv is dy, v is y. So y times tan inverse y minus the integral of v du. So now we have the integral of y times 1 over 1 plus y squared dy. Well, notice now I have a rational expression for the integrand. And not only that, this is an easy substitution integral. Notice we can use substitution here. I'll set w equal to 1 plus y squared, then dw is simply 2y dy. So the y dy is 1 half dw. So we get y times tan inverse y minus 1 half integral dw over w after substituting. Well, Integral dw over w is simply natural log absolute value of w. And so consequently, going on to another sheet here, we have y times tan inverse y minus integral dw over w, where w is 1 plus y squared. And so that's y times tan inverse y minus, oh, let's not forget that factor of a half. That's important. We have minus a half natural logarithm absolute value of w, which is y times tangent inverse y minus actually what is w? 1 plus y squared. Notice that's always greater than or equal to 1. That means we can forget the absolute value since 1 plus y squared is always greater than or equal to 0. 1 half the logarithm is the same as the log of the square root. So this is natural log square root of 1 plus y squared. And of course, we have to add the big capital C. Now let's look at a problem where we have a product of a power of x and an exponential. These are kinds of problems that often come up in applications. Here, I want to anti-differentiate, find the indefinite integral of x cubed e to the x dx. Notice it's obviously a product. Of course, differentiating and anti-differentiating e to the x just leads to e to the x either way. And so consequently, it should be pretty obvious the thing to set dv here is equal to e to the x dx. And so u is x cubed. 
differentiating u will lower the power. So du is 3x squared dx, whereas the v is again e to the x. So according to the formula for integration by parts, u times v, that's x cubed e to the x, minus the integral v du. v is e to the x, du is 3x squared dx, so we'll get 3x squared e to the x dx. Notice it's exactly the same type of problem we began with, power of x times e to the x. And so we can just keep going with integration by parts. Here, let's take u to be the 3x squared, and again, dv will be e to the x dx. So now du is 6x dx, and v is again e to the x. And so now we have x cubed e to the x minus this anti-differentiation. Well, u times v, that's 3x squared e to the x minus the integral v du. That's e to the x times the 6x, or I'll write that as 6x e to the x dx. Notice now our power is lowered to 1. We can apply the same technique again. Here's u, here's dv, so u is now simply 6. I mean du is 6 dx, and v is still e to the x. So we'll have x cubed e to the x minus 3x squared e to the x. Minus a minus is a plus the integral, this last one, but we're going to use integration by parts to transform it. So plus u times v, that's plus 6x e to the x. And then finally minus the integral v du, which is 6 e to the x dx. And notice that's simply minus 6 e to the x plus a big capital C. So let's write this out once and for all. We have integral x cubed e to the x dx equals x cubed e to the x minus 3x squared e to the x plus 6x times e to the x minus 6 e to the x plus a capital C. It's amazing that I could remember all those terms like that, isn't it, so easily? <laughs> Do you notice there's a simple pattern here? Notice we have x cubed, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, the derivative of 3x squared is 6x, the derivative of 6x is 6. The signs simply alternate. And so if I factor out the e to the x, notice what I have here. x cubed minus 3x squared plus 6x minus 6, all multiplying the e to the x plus c. You might ask yourself, is that an accident? Well, it's no accident. Suppose I take a polynomial, p of x, any polynomial. Well, suppose px is any polynomial. That is, p of x could have been the x cubed we have in our problem, or it could even be some complicated polynomial with big coefficients and high powers of x. Notice that if I differentiate, all the powers get lowered, and so finally, after so many differentiations, the derivative is zero. So I can form the expression g of x, which will also be a polynomial, equals p of x minus p prime of x 
plus p double prime of x minus p triple prime of x and so on and finally we end up with zero so there's g of x you can easily form this for any polynomial of course it might get laborious if there are many terms and high powers but it's a straightforward process well if i differentiate g of x times e to the x the power rule, uh, the, excuse me, the product rule tells me differentiate the first factor times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second, but the derivative of e to the x is simply e to the x. And so consequently, I get g of x plus g prime of x all times e to the x. Well, notice what's going to happen if I differentiate g of x. g of x has as its derivative p prime of x minus p double prime of x plus p triple prime of x and so on down the line. The same terms as I've got here except with signs reverse. So when I add g of x to g prime of x, all these derivatives cancel out leaving me p of x. And so consequently, that'll happen every time you anti-differentiate a polynomial times e to the x. All you do is start differentiating. Write the polynomial down, minus its derivative, plus its second derivative, minus its third derivative. Keep going till you get down to zero. Put brackets around it all. Multiply by the e to the x and add the big capital C. Let's look at another problem where we can use integration by parts, but let's not forget the method of substitution as well. Here, I want to calculate the indefinite integral of e to the power square root of quantity 3s plus 9 ds. So when we see something like that, the first thing to do is to simplify, since that's just a linear expression in x, the 3s plus 9, in s rather, I will set x equal to 3s plus 9. Then dx equals 3 ds, and so ds is simply one-third dx. And so that means we have one-third integral e to the square root x dx. So now our question is, how do we find the indefinite integral of e to the square root x dx? I don't see any extra factors here. What I'm going to do to start with is I'm going to do a substitution w equals square root x itself. Then dw is 1 over 2 square root x dx. Notice the square root x is w, so I can say this is 1 over 2 w dx. In effect, the dx is equal to 2w dw. And so consequently, after substitution, what we get for the integral of e to the square root x dx is e to the w times 2w dw. So consequently, our original integral right here is 1 third the integral e to the w times 2w dw, which now if I take the 2 out, we have 2 thirds times the integral e to the w times w dw. So let's write this down finally. In summary, we have integral e to the square root 3s plus 9 ds equals 2 thirds integral e to the w, w dw, and remember what was w? w is the square root of x, and the x 
is 3s plus 9, and so that means w will finally, in fact, be the square root of 3s plus 9. But when I look at this integral, e to the w times w dw, I see that's an easy integration by parts. So we have 2 thirds integral w e to the w dw. So I will set u equal to w. dv is e to the w dw. And so consequently, du is dw, v is e to the w, and so we have two-thirds times the product of u times v, w, e to the w, minus integral v du, that's e to the w dw. Of course, just as in our preceding example, we see what's happening here with this simple polynomial times exponential, but in any case, we're working it out using integration by parts. Antiderivative e to the w dw is obviously e to the w, and so we have two-thirds w e to the w minus e to the w, and now we can simply substitute what w is. It's the square root of 3s plus 9. So we have 2 thirds square root of 3s plus 9 e to the square root 3s plus 9 minus e to the square root 3s plus 9 all inside the brackets, and finally, don't forget to add the big capital C. When you see a function of the natural logarithm, substitution or integration by parts will usually work. Let's look at an example. Here I have the antiderivative of sine of ln x dx. Now, what I would like to do if I were to apply substitution would be to set u equal to ln x, but then du would be 1 over x dx, and I don't have any x out here by itself. So the next thing we can do, and this is typical in these types of problems where you have some expression involving ln x, is you can try setting the u in integration by parts equal to the entire expression. So we'll take u to be the sine of ln x, and then our dv is simply the dx. So consequently, du is equal to the derivative of sine of ln x dx. Well, differentiating by the chain rule, the derivative of sine is cosine, so we have cosine of ln x multiplied by the derivative of ln x, which is 1 over x and then finally, we multiply by dx. So du is cosine of the natural log of x times 1 over x dx. On the other hand, our v is x, very simply. And so using integration by parts, u times v, that's x times the sine of the natural log x minus integral v du. Well, notice when I multiply v times this expression, the x's cancel, and I just have the negative of cosine of ln x dx. Notice that's exactly the same type of problem we started with. So let's try the same technique on the integral cosine of ln x dx. So I will set u to be the entire expression cosine of ln x dx. The dv is dx, and so v is simply x. So what is du? du, by the chain rule, is negative sine of ln x multiplied by the derivative of ln x, which is 1 over x dx. And so this integral is then u times v, x cosine of ln x, 
minus the integral v du. Well, notice we have a negative sign here, so that'll change that negative sign back to plus integral of the x's cancel sine of ln x dx. So notice the antiderivative or the indefinite integral of sine of ln x dx is x sine ln x minus the indefinite integral for the cosine of ln x. The indefinite integral for the cosine of ln x is x cosine ln ln of x plus the indefinite integral of the sine of ln of x dx. I'm back to where I started, but notice what's going to happen when I put this expression, all of this, in for this indefinite integral. I'll have minus the x cosine ln x minus the integral, the same integral I started with. So I can take that term and move it back over to the other side and have twice. In other words, I will end up with the formula 2 times the integral sine of ln x dx equals x times sine of ln x minus x times cosine of ln x. So consequently, I can simply divide through by 2. Notice I could factor out the x. And so let me go to a new sheet now, and we'll summarize this result. We have twice the integral of sine of ln of x dx equals x times sine of ln of x minus x times cosine of ln of x. And so let's divide through by 2. We finally arrive at the formula indefinite integral of sine ln of x dx equals 1 half, and let's factor out the x, sine of ln of x minus cosine of ln of x. And of course, the last step, don't forget to add the big capital C. Let's look at an example involving the inverse sine function. Here, I want to compute the antiderivative of inverse sine of x dx. That is the indefinite integral, inverse sine x dx. Whenever you see this type of thing, an inverse function, what you simply want to do is use integration by parts, setting u to be the inverse function. Then dv is dx, and so v is simply x. On the other hand, du, the derivative of inverse sine x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So du is 1 over root 1 minus x squared dx. So now using our formula for integration by parts, u times v, that's x sine inverse x minus the integral of v x, which is x, du, which is 1 over square root 1 minus x squared dx. And this is what happens every time we have an inverse trig function. The du will be an expression involving a radical of some expression with x squared or else no radical, just the quadratic polynomial there, and then the x in the numerator, and so we will arrive at an integral which we can solve by substitution. And so consequently here using substitution, I will let w be 1 minus x squared, dw is negative 2x dx. And so we'll have altogether x sine inverse x minus a minus is a plus, and the dx, the x dx is 1 half dw. So we'll have 1 half integral 
dw divided by the square root of w. That is w to the negative one-half power. And so its antiderivative is w to the one-half over one-half. That is the one-halves cancel. And so consequently, we will get x sine inverse x plus square root w. Now, of course, we have to put what w is in terms of x. It's the 1 minus x squared. So we have x sine inverse x plus the square root of 1 minus x squared. And then, of course, we can't forget to add the big capital C. Well, we've looked at some examples where we've used integration by parts. Remember, the first strategy in indefinite integration is to use substitution. But then when substitution doesn't work, the next thing to try is integration by parts. In particular, whenever you see an integrand having an inverse function, it's usually a good idea to use integration by parts where we set u just equal to that inverse function. Well, now that you've seen these examples work, why don't you try some on your own?